before we begin, a quick disclaimer. The show is for entertainment and informational purposes only. Nothing said on the show is investment advice or a solicitation to buy or sell any security. Nothing said should be relied upon as investment advice. Both guests or hosts and clients of either may own any securities mentioned. And without further ado, let's go right to this episode's special guest. And this is from the house with the special situations re- report. Uh, today we have a very special guest. It's Harris Kupperman from uh, Praetorian Capital and the well-known um, site Advantage in Capitalism. Recently launched uh, KDM. Um, Harris, you told me it's okay if I call you uh, Kupi, so I'll, I'll do that from now on. Uh, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Um, no, it's uh, entirely my pleasure. So for people who um, haven't seen you in, um, because you're like a regular on some um, great shows like um, a Real Vision, you've appeared several times there, I think. And uh, yeah, on um, the I've been on there a few times. Uh, actually a great show. It is, and I think it's very widely watched. So maybe everybody knows you. Uh, and, there, and the market at all, I think it's widely uh, viewed or listened to. Uh, that's a great show. You're a regular there, right? Or like once a month or? Yeah, basically once a month or whatever a guest cancels. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's, uh, I, I love that show and it's always really entertaining if you, uh, when you get on. Um, so, but could you, people who don't know you, maybe you could tell us a little bit about yourself. I think you're a history uh, major. Uh, that's a little bit of an unusual background. And uh, how did you get into investing and uh, why do you love it so much? So, yeah, I am a history major. And I, I look at the world, I think, very differently than most people that look at the world through spreadsheets because they're business majors. Um, you know, as, as a history major, I know that these cycles repeat over and over and over and no one ever learns from their history. Um, and if you are willing to look at the past 10 or 20 cycles of whatever the thing is that you're focused on, there'll be uh, interesting data there and the stuff usually repeats. So I just think that's where the edge is. Uh, I got into stocks. uh, I got got really hooked uh, when I was in uh, boarding school. Instead of going to class, I had a few thousand dollars from cleaning pools one summer and I uh, was day trading stocks uh, poorly. and I eventually figured out how to make money at this. And uh, my senior year of college, I launched a hedge fund. Uh, it's you know, been very successful. Um, and you know, that's my track record. That's my history. I, I've done basically three things and done them well throughout my career. Uh, one is small cap growth. That's really you know, the thing I'm most excited about. Um, unfortunately, we're in this weird moment in time where anything with any revenue growth uh, trades at stupid multiples. And so... Uh, I think we'll talk about a few of them today that are really cheap, but for the most part, I'm not finding much to do there. Um, you know, I remember uh, 15, 20 years ago, you buy small cap companies growing 50% a year. You buy them at five times after tax cash flow. You know, now you can't buy them at five times revenue. <laughs> so um, I was doing a lot more inflection investing, uh, which is uh, cyclical businesses that, uh, you know, you ride the cycles. It's secular changes in businesses, uh, but then we're doing also a lot of event driven and often they overlap. Uh, you know, when you uh, change your cap structure of a company, whether it's a spinoff or a recap or, you know, anything, you know, buybacks, uh, anything like that, that would change the cap structure to change the valuation, uh, you know, changing the management, CEO change, uh, spinoffs and demutualizations and privatizations and, you know, bankruptcy and post-bankruptcy, all these strategies that are really the, the bedrock of uh, event-driven trading often coalesce and um, overlap with uh, these inflections too. I mean, companies go bankrupt because their sector goes crappy. <laughs> usually you'll see a lot of companies come out at the same time. That usually is what sets up the next upcycle in that industry. Right now we're seeing energy and energy services all emerging from bankruptcy and going straight up. So, you know, you can overlay these two. Um, you know, I want to talk more about the event driven side, but um, I, I don't think it's uh, right to ever look at one discipline in isolation. And when they overlap, there's usually better uh, signal to noise. And 
that, that, that's really my background is those three strategies and doing the same thing and hopefully doing it better each time. I know that that's like super interesting. So you, you've been in like um, small cap growth, like after the financial crisis, when it's like one of the better areas to, to go into that that's when you wrote that or uh, was that like straight away on interest from uh, back into college? Oh, just straight out of college. Uh, I was playing small cap. I mean, I started doing, I, mean, I started a lot of uh, day trading because, I mean, that's what I saw people talking about. But right. when you had a dial up modem and the market makers don't display your bids and offers, and, you know, you have classes to go to, you can't be much of a day trader. And so I, I started learning about how to value companies and I learned about cycles. And what was really funny about uh, the, the tech bubble is that if it wasn't tech, it was really cheap. And, you know, I read enough to know that these things are mean reverting. And we bought, I bought a bunch of cheap value names personally. I remember one of the first things I bought was uh, Philip Morris when it had north of a 20% dividend yield and it traded three times cash flow. Uh, you know, I probably wouldn't have a hedge fund today if not for me being a 17, 18 year old at the golf course with my dad, uh, telling all his drinking buddies to buy some Philip Morris. And at the time, they were all buying like Yahoo and CMGI and ICG and stuff that doesn't exist anymore. And fortunately, enough of them bought uh, some Philip Morris because it ended up being like a 10 bagger in three or four years. And uh, they said, hey, Cuppy, you're good at this. Uh, you know, here's some money. Why don't you put it into a fund? And that's kind of how I got to have a fund. But I had a few of these. Uh, you know, Methanex was another great one. And, uh, when 9-11 uh, happened, we were in hotel stocks. I was just giving out stock tips, basically, with my dad's uh, golf buddies. But So that was I, like after 9-11 happened, you uh, right, right. I mean, picked up like the hotel stocks. Yeah, December and Jan December of 01, January of 02. Uh, I bought a bunch of hotel stocks at N20 cents on replacement cost. And um, you know, fortunately, uh, occupancy rebounded and they were multi, multi baggers for me. And I always remember telling my, my dad's friends to go buy these things. The problem, though, is that you'd have 20 different conversations with 20 different people and you forget who you told what to. And then you forget to tell them to sell. And, it just ended up being a better process to have a fund. And so that, uh, I launched the fund uh, my senior year of college. Right. Um, right fortunately, right. I made people some money and they trusted me. Yeah. And uh, I think they really like enthusiasm of young people and uh, want to do something. If they trust you, I can imagine that, uh, well, you know, that, that went well. Um, well, young people also have no idea the stuff they don't know. So. <laughs> You're kind of dangerous. <laughs> you have no fear, right? You have no fear. Well, yeah, you don't know common sense. And yeah. Look, but, you know, if you look at those sort of investments, they weren't deep dive. Uh, I mean, obviously, they're deep dive value. But they weren't deep dive spreadsheet investments. Uh, you know, there was no uh, differentiated opinion that uh, 20 tabs of the spreadsheet would let you know. Um, this was just basically, is three times cash flow good enough for, you know, Philip Morris, or will people eventually go to hotels in Manhattan again? This wasn't like rocket science. Like that. Right. And so Philip Morris is, again, uh, it's pretty attractive. Maybe not that attractive, but it's pretty attractive. And are other things reminding you of 99, or do you think... Uh, well, right current... now we're in the, the bubble of all bubbles. Um, there... I mean, at least in 99, 2000, you could look at some of these tech stocks and say, you know, no one knows what the internet's going to look like. These things could become super dominant businesses. And, you know, this business is a billion dollars, that business is two billion. Like it could become a, you know, 50, 100 bagger if the internet turns out this way or that way. You know, there, there's a lot of unknowns. Here, the bubble is a uh, dog coin, or it is, you know, AMC, where we know cinema is dying. We know it's overvalued. We know that uh, management thinks it's overvalued because they can beggar the share count. Um, everyone in the entire ecosystem knows this is dumb, yet there are people who are 
buying this stock. It trades tens of millions of shares a day and it defies all logic of everything I've ever learned about business and finance. AMC will not become a dominant business. AMC will be forgotten in history. Um, and you can say that about dog coin. You can say that about a lot of the weird assets that have multi-billion dollar valuations have no revenue. Um, you know, all these SPAC EV companies and whatnot. I mean, at least back during 99, these companies had rapidly accelerating revenue and they were dominant in their own little niches. Um, and occasionally someone like Microsoft would overpay and buy one of these things. Uh, so so it, it's, it's a different sort of bubble and it defies all sense of logic. Right. But so I, I find that pretty challenging that um, f fundamentals, I mean, it's not that they don't count, but um, you, sometimes you, you need a lot of patience. And the last few years, it, really don't seem to be working that well. I think there's even an AQR paper about it, value is dead or something. Um, and- I agree with that. Well, Our, no, please. Value, value always works and value, if you're correct about the valuation, it's getting resolved these days, not through the uh, open market uh, forces, though sometimes it is, but management takes it private, PE takes it private, um, in 2018, I put 11 positions on and I had five either go private or someone launched a hustle bid or something. I mean, basically half my book disappeared over the course of the year at, you know, large premiums. I think uh, the company sold out too cheaply, but, you know, you wake up in the morning and you're up 75%. It's not a bad outcome. Um, last year I had a few get acquired from me, um, you know, I'm sure I mean, this year is still young. It looks like one of my companies has a, a PE fund after today. The stock's up 20%. Um, and I, I think valuation will get solved that way. It'll get solved through buybacks. It'll solve, it'll solve through cap structure changes. And then, look, value seems to be working. I mean, I've had two consecutive huge years. It's, it's working. <laughs> it, it, sure. I think people look at value and they look at something like IBM and they say, look, it has a big dividend yield, it's cheap on cash flow, but everyone knows IBM is dying. So it is cheap. It's been cheap. It will eventually go poof. Like, yeah. that, that's kind of how I think of value. You know, it's some boring, dying business. No, and if, um, I think some of, you know, you look at this inflection points. I've got um, like an interesting example. I think it's um, like Joe, this real estate company on the Florida coast, right? right. And um, well, I've known about that company for a long time because it was like a big battle of the mines between uh, Berkowitz and Einhorn. I think right after the great financial crisis, it was like 90 or 80 per share before the financial crisis totally crashed. Um, they got into sort of a, Berkowitz was a big long and he's the chairman currently, I think. And yes. Einhorn went short with a public piece, you know, and he was super respected at that time because he crushed it uh, in financial crisis. Einhorn was right. <laughs> I mean... And then, but it did nothing for our, no, nothing. It just declined for like nine years straight. And I think you got in at like 10 or 15 or something. Uh, just went up, you know, it's it, up to 60 or something like that. Maybe it's 40 now. And you, you kind of have a knack for finding these ideas that, um, you know, inflect. And I, I don't know. How do you do that? What is, how do you know that it's going to change? You know, something's going to change in the thesis because I think this is a perfect example. It's like nine years of declines. Well, I mean, something like Joe, I, I think everyone knows, I don't think there's any debate at all that uh, the net asset value of their 175,000 acres, the net asset value is somewhere between 100 and 200 dollars a share. I think they're, there's no debate about that. Uh, longs, guys who are on the sidelines, guys who are short. I think everyone agrees with that fact. Um, you know, the question really is what's going to unlock the value. 
Um, because there's a lot of stocks that trade at market discounts to uh, some of the parts and need a catalyst to unlock it. And I, I'd say the discount got un unreasonably large at uh, Joe. You know, normally these things trade at 70 or 80 cents on the dollar. So Joe should have been maybe 100. But, you know, it traded down to 16 um, because there was no catalyst. And it didn't appear that there ever would be a catalyst. And money has a uh, value to it, and people want their money working hard for them. And so no one wanted to lock it up for what turned out to be 20 years of no returns. I mean, I think the market got it right. But what the market missed is that a uh, new management came in in the uh, middle of uh, last decade, and they took a different approach to uh, the running of the company. Previously, management built these giant master plan communities, a lot of CapEx up front. They sold off the beachfront lots, and then no one wanted the inland lots. And they ended up with nothing they could monetize. They just had acreage. The new guys said, let's make this a destination where people actually want to be. You know, let's make this a retirement community. Let's make this, you know, each individual community having a different feel. So you have some woodsy ones. You have ones with lakes. You have ones that are on the shore. Uh, I mean, they still have 200 miles of coastline to sell. Um, and they started selling lots and they, they got to a critical mass. They, they really focused on the commercial side. So you have recurring revenue. Um, and of course, you know, you, you always have the chicken and egg problem. No one wants to move to the middle of nowhere if it's nothing to do. But you can't get uh, high quality tenants of restaurants if there's no customers. So you have this chicken and egg problem where you're gonna have to suffer on one side or the other to subsidize someone. And they subsidized an airport that's now a rapidly growing airport. They subsidized uh, commerce. They did a lot of things to bring people in and they started uh, ramping lot sales. I mean, I've been going up there every few years checking up on my stock. I knew it was cheap and I wanted to catch the inflection. And what happened in my mind was that when COVID hit, people realized you could work from home and it's one of the most beautiful places in the United States on the coast there. Um, it's one of the beautiful, most beautiful beaches. And for people from New York, it's you know zero tax. And so you started having a real uh, migration of people. And I was up there last summer with my wife because we were hiding from COVID. Because uh, you know Miami, where I was from at the time, uh, you know they had lockdowns and you know, Panhandle, they, they just kind of ignored it all. Um, so we rented a summer house there, and we started talking to some of the brokers, and they started saying stuff like, "We never." ever had New Yorkers coming down. Now we're only selling to New Yorkers. New Yorkers are paying three times what the guys from Atlanta was willing to pay. And then you went to the county clerk and all the data's there, all the sales. We said, wow, you know, well, home prices have tripled this year. <laughs> and then you can queue in on every lot that Joe sold because the data's there. And you can say, wow, I, I see this, you know, it was growing 20% a year sequentially, let's say. It started growing 100% a year. So you have all this analytical data and you say, this is inflecting. We sat down and talked to management and they were super optimistic. Whereas a few years earlier, I mean, there was so little going on. They just kind of hung around for a three hour lunch with us. They were actually busy with stuff. <laughs> it was just obvious that it was like inflecting. And so I made it my largest position about 19 bucks. Um, I never sold a share when I got almost to 60. And uh, the last couple of weeks, I've bought a lot more in the mid forties, mid low forties. Um, I think that my model uh, for cash flow is way too conservative now, whereas six months ago, people told me I was too aggressive. I'm going to have to redo my model very soon. But um, I think I'm buying this at a mid-single-digit cash flow on where the cash flow is in 24. Um, and I'm getting 100 bucks a land for free. Uh, if you think this uh, you know, cash flow stream is worth 30 times because it doubles every two years, and I don't know, the shares should be, the operating business should be 200 and the land 100. I mean, it should be traded 300 today. Um, I'm not saying that's the right number, but it's just materially mispriced in any metrics you can use. And so um, it's the cheapest stock on the board and it's my biggest possession. Uh, so but and, and so there's, you actually visit there with like a uh, county clerk to look at those uh, sales. Oh, that's all online. Oh, it's all online. You can find it online, um, okay. But it's not yeah, like yeah, the mean, company's materials or... Um, no, no. I mean, the company does pretty... Uh, they, they do a poor job at investor relations. I, I find that a lot of the things I invest with, um, the business runs just fine. It's just that management isn't very good at telling their story. 
you know, Joe has done some things recently. I mean, they have 40 or 50 projects on their go in commercial real estate. Uh, once a month, they fly a drone. They put out a YouTube video. Uh, I think they get about 10 people who watch those YouTube videos. I, I check. It's, no one watches it, but it's there. It shows you all the progress on all their projects. Um, it's amazing how much is going on. I mean, people tell me Joe is a sleepy land bank, and that's what it was 10 years ago. But here we are. They had 122% year-over-year revenue growth in Q1. Um, I think that, you know they're going to report Q2 pretty soon. I think it's going to be some massive quarter again. Uh, how many SaaS companies grow at uh, 100% year over year? Like none of them. And they all trade at stupid multiples on revenue. And here you are, you can buy this at a single digit cash flow multiple. It just, it's, it's mispriced. It's, um, and everything I do is find something that's horribly mispriced and get there when the business is flex. And then I don't try to overthink it. I don't day trade it. I don't come in and out. Uh, I just own it until uh, the rest of the world realizes it. Um, I think this is a 10 or 20 bagger from here in the next few years. Right. And then now uh, I can, I'm thinking because you've got, you've got quite um, a, a remarkable view on inflation. You think uh, it's here to stay and uh, uh, it could be bad. Um, land banks are pretty interesting in an inflationary environment. Does that play into your uh, well, absolutely. position? Or? I mean, the, re the reason it's working now, I mean, I think management's done a very good job of operating the business, but if you have no demand, you have no demand for your properties, there's nothing you can do. We're in a unique inflation and every inflation is different. If you look at historical inflations, this one's going to be odd because a lot of the past inflation, you know, you, you had... Some, someone go off the gold standard and it all fell apart. Here, we don't have any of that thing that's tethering us to anything. I kind of think that the Federal Reserve will keep interest rates suppressed while inflation goes crazy. And so if you're uh, an upper middle class guy with some extra you know, cash sitting around, you're not going to buy muni bonds. What you're going to do is go buy your summer home for your family because you're going to finance it at three and it's going to appreciate 20 a year. Uh, it's, it's the best, you know, carry trade you could ever put on. Um, and I, I think people are going to buy second homes. They're going to you know, buy some homes for income. They're going to do things in real estate. I think real estate will do quite well, um, you know, as long as you can control and reprice the rents. But for a lot of people, I think they're just going to buy a second home. And I mean, like I said, I think it's the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful parts of the country. I, I, I assume people will buy a second home in uh, the Panhandle. And so, uh, yeah, definitely that yeah. Uh, backdrop. I mean, yeah. I, I, I try to combine a, a macro view with a corporate view. Um, so it, it works. Yeah, and as well, I'm an outsider to the United States, but this whole, um, well, um, tax thing seems to have a life on its own as well. It seems to gain some critical mass. I hear it so often that people are moving from New York area or New Jersey to Florida. It's, it, I'm surprised how often I I come across it. Well, you have you know a real bifurcation in America now culturally. You have uh, the coastal cities that have one culture. It tends to be liberal. It tends to be high tax, and it tends to be high crime. And these cities tend to be hardly mismanaged when compared to ten or twenty years ago. You know, it's like trash in the streets and sewage and. The police aren't allowed to do their jobs. And then you have places like Florida that are reasonably well run. I mean, Florida was a laughing stock 10, 20 years ago. And here we are, they've picked up their game and the big cities are falling apart. And when you have a thousand or 1500 basis points differential in terms of tax regime and increasingly business is mobile, you know, it's intellectual capital, it's not physical capital. People are going to go where they're treated best and where the capital is treated best. And I think you're going to see a long-term demographic move. And then besides, I mean, who the hell wants to be in the Northeast and cold six months a year? Like, Florida is beautiful. No, I, I, you know, it would be great to be in a better climate. And that Netherlands isn't that great uh, on that front either. Um, let's see. So um, I, I happen to to one, uh, once be in a company, um, uh, you you bought as well. Uh, I th think. Well, 
I've I bought it before I heard you talk about it, and it was Galaxy Digital. I think it's kind of interesting because I, I got in at one or below one, and it was a really cheap uh, sort of an option on uh, like cryptocurrencies doing something or coming back because it was when it was kind of out of favor uh, last year or some maybe early last year or, or the year before that. And maybe it was even a net net, I'm not sure. But anyway, I bought a little bit. And I think I, I saw it at four or two or something and it was a great result, but it was at a tiny amount. Uh, but it went to like 15 or maybe even 40. Yeah, I saw too soon. I got sick looking at it. I think you saw it too soon as well. I, but do you have? I bought, I bought mine between seventy-five cents and about a dollar and a quarter. At, at the time, it was trading for less than the value of their cash and their Bitcoin they owned. And I, I was turning pretty bullish on Bitcoin back then. This is when Bitcoin was like six, seven thousand. And I was turning bullish on Bitcoin, and so I was able to buy a bunch of Bitcoin at like two, three thousand by my math, and it just seemed like a good way to play crypto in general. And uh, you know, we actually became one of the largest shareholders. Um, you know, it was basically wow. a company doing a buyback. Uh, Mike Novogratz buying the open market in us. Yeah, uh, we, we ended up buying a you know a couple percent of it, and then um, it uh, did what we expected it to. It went from a discount to net asset value to a decent sized premium to net asset value, and I wasn't all that enamored with uh, their banking business because. I don't know how you value a lot of things that they were investing in. And they, they seem to be taking impairments and losses pretty regularly, you know, trading coins and SGNA seemed pretty elevated to me. And I just said, this isn't uh, what I signed up for. I, I want kind of a pure play on, uh, you know, Bitcoin, not, not so much, uh, you know, owning into a merchant bank um, that, that seemed to be fumbling along. And so we, we tossed ours at about two and a half times net asset value and we bought uh, Grayscale instead. Uh, I, I guess I should have held the Galaxy, but I don't know. I sold mine about four bucks. It was like a four bagger in three months, four months. I mean, you, you can't be too upset with that. <laughs> no, and no, it, no. It, yeah. And then it gave me a lot of capital. And I just kind of pyramided the capital into uh, the Grayscale, which ended up being like another four or five bagger. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Um, so you just take that, you know, as a win and you move on and you don't mind that that sometimes happens that people uh, buy this stuff off you as a value investor, you get it really cheap, you make 100% or in this case more. And um, you don't mind if it goes on a huge run. No, because that's not what I do. I mean, yeah. I buy undervalued securities that have a, a macro tailwind or they have some sort of you know, corporate change tailwind, something's happening right. right. And when it gets to, uh, I mean, either, either the, strat the the business model changes or they do something I don't like. Yeah. And with Galaxy, I, I just didn't understand why they were taking uh, uh, losses trading crypto when crypto was in a bull market. It, it boggled the mind that they had two or three consecutive quarters where they lost money effectively in a long crypto fund while crypto was going up. I said, this isn't right for me. This isn't what I want. But this was one where I, I thought the strategy was floundering, so I tossed it. But usually yeah. I, I either, you know, something changes the business or something, um, it, get, it gets to a value that you know, I wake up in the morning and say, if I wouldn't buy it here, then I should probably sell it and I sell it. And it, I mean, if you buy the things I sold, the, the winners, you'd probably have a very good track record. But I don't like to risk my capital. It's very precious to me. And I'd rather cycle into something that's very cheap rather than try to squeeze a little bit more out of it, which is you know, the way I do it. I'm not saying it's the right way, to do it. it's just the way I do it. Yeah. Yeah. I, one time before, I had a similar experience with a company called Tellurian. And uh, it was like a super cheap uh, thing. And um, it got acquired by um, like a, a um, like a big star CEO. And uh, I sold it way too early. And um, this kind of reminded me of it because it's like Novograd's a little bit of a, you know, a star. And then people can get like really excited. And I, I don't, you know, I felt stupid for doing that twice. Don't feel stupid. If you made money, then you won. Uh, sure. Um, 
Sure. Look, I thought Novogratz would promote it. He promoted it. I just kind of lost confidence in what was happening there at the business. Um, it is what it is. Uh, I've had a lot of these that I've sold. They go up a lot. Right. Good. It means I was right. <laughs> yeah, well, absolutely. And then uh, maybe I'll tie this into, um, you've recently launched um, a research server called uh, KEDM. Uh, it's at KEDM.com. And it's really interesting because it has like uh, 15 to 20, no, maybe it's even more like event-driven screens where you flag a lot of uh, interesting opportunities. And maybe to explain a little bit better, it can be like more vanilla things like companies that do a lot of buybacks or um, uh, cluster buying, insider kind of insider buying, but also very um, hard to find things like changing CEOs. And you have two screens of fallen angel and left for that screen. And though I think those are a little bit about what yeah, we just, just talked about, like um, your inflection investing. Can you maybe uh, uh, tell us a little bit how you use those screens or, um, yeah, because that's, I think that's the source of how you uh, find these things, right? Right. I mean, in the end, when you look at the world, um, most securities are roughly fairly valued. There's a lot of really smart people kicking through not that many ticker symbols. And increasingly with computers, they're using AI. And I mean, we're all going to be obsolete. Um, it's, so what you need is you need uh, some sort of fundamental change at a company that the computers don't see. Um, and either that's some sort of macro inflection. You know, we just talked about that with St. Joe. Uh, the computers just weren't scanning the county clerk records in Bay and Walton County, Florida. Or you're going to have some sort of a corporate event where values unlocked or the direction of business changes. So, you know, I think one of my favorite ones is the CEO change. Um, you know, CEOs change all the time. Guys retire, guys get fired, you know, guys die. And every time a new CEO comes in, they're often going to change the trajectory of the business. Sometimes it's better, sometimes it's worse. Um, and so you can look at that and, I, you know, something's going to change. I mean, Joe, the new management, I think done a phenomenal job. I mean, look at some of the big winners from the last year. GameStop with the CEO change. Bed Bath with the CEO change. Um, you know, these are situations where, People have given up on these companies and the new guys came in and uh, convinced the street that there was a future. Um, and, you know, that, that's one scan that we uh, create manually. It's, you know, no, you can't pull it up on Bloomberg. What we found is the stuff that's on Bloomberg, it gets picked over pretty fast. You know, spinoffs, there's too many guys following that. Uh, foreign spinoffs, meanwhile, there's no one following it, which is surprising. But a lot of these uh, screens that we're putting together and increasingly the ones that we're going to be, we hired a guy, we're going to hire a few more. Um, the, the screens that we're going to be creating are screens that change a corporate uh, trajectory and the, the data is not uh, freely available. We have to build it ourselves. And I think that creates a lot of opportunity. Uh, you know, it, the, the things that change trajectory is, you know, uh, cap structure, management, um, you know, there's a lot of these. I mean, even something yeah. simple like a cluster buy, you're not changing the trajectory, but you're, you're, you're seeing, hey, a couple of different people on the inside who have better data than me all agree at roughly the same time that things are getting better and that they want to buy. But all of these sort of screens, I think, uh, can be used uh, to find opportunities and basically to narrow the list of securities you want to spend your time on because I mean, you, get, you want to be a productive person. And we built this uh, not so much to sell a product, um, which is very different, I think, from, the, from most newsletters. But we really built this because I wanted the data. And I asked a friend of mine to put it all together for me. And then a bunch of my friends wanted the data. So we started distributing it to them. And then we said, hey, let's put it into a PDF and sell the data so that we can hire some really smart people and get better data. Um, and it's kind of like crowdfunding my research effort in a way. Right. Yeah. And I, um, I don't, you know, I think th these are some of the best services that are built around people's things they want themselves uh, or use themselves. Um, and uh, they're not always the most commercial 
commercially viable or something but uh yeah i think they're like the, the best and um yeah, so yeah, this is, i mean it's, it's designed and formatted exactly how i want it and we've never really cared what anyone else wanted <laughs> and uh, you know i'm really happy and lucky that it turned out other people want it um, yeah and then we put together a chat room for the subscribers and I mean, any given day, you have a few hundred people in there talking about event driven, and it's too much in the world for any one person to follow, even a, a team of analysts. And here we are with very smart people having detailed conversations about various events that are happening. I mean, I could read a thread and I'm up to speed rather than wasting a day of my life learning about a stock. It's, it's phenomenal what, what uh, the value so, of that community. So you, you're getting value from the chat as oh, well? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, because you were, I think you were already somebody who would talk to a lot of other people and have a very good network of uh, well, investors. I mean, yeah, absolutely. But a bunch of my friends joined the chat. So, you know, right. people that maybe didn't know each other or, you know, one guy would send me an email, I'd send that guy an email, someone else. Well, now we're just all in a thread together. It's just better. Cool. It's, it's, it's all in one place. And people who are watching, they have opinions. And... I don't know. I, th I think it's a really valuable resource for people that want to do event driven trading, which is a very narrow subset of it. Yeah, or I think there's a lot of people will use like a, a select few of the screens, but they those will be very useful because some of them are like what one I wanted to highlight a little bit is um, uh, currently I do a lot of specs, and um, well, you're seeing a lot of problems there. And so you've been flagging like unlocks, right? Because those are great to short because specs are kind of overloaded with um, that dilutive securities and they don't always do so well after the uh, business combination. And then the unlock when the insiders can get out, that's a real great uh, moment to, uh, to short in your, your opinion. And um, I think you, you also did some work or you're doing some work on um, because it's actually not so straightforward, right? When when that unlock actually happens. Right, I mean, when you think of these SPACs, uh, you really should think of them like an iceberg, okay? They IPO 20 million shares. Um, founders get some free shares, free warrants, there's uh, warrants given out. Um, and then they announce a deal and they do a pipe for another you know, 50 million shares and they give another 200 million shares to the insider. So you look at that 20 million shares, but you know, in, in reality, you have 300, 400 million shares outstanding. And you're just looking at a little tip of it that's setting the, the incremental price. But then when it works backwards, uh, 30 days after the deal closes, you're gonna have the pipes, they're allowed to sell. Um, and what we've seen a lot was that when you uh, did a merger with an EV fraud, you know, back in January, you announced, you know, we're, we're buying EV fraud co and the stock went from 10 to 40. And so everyone who's in the pipe, you know, they might not sell at 40, but they'll sell at 25. And so it was yeah. a really good return on capital for people to lock up their money for a few months. So a lot of people did a lot of these pipe deals. Well, it turns out, you know, buying a pipe in a fraud is a way to lose money. And so now the stock trades at $8 and then the pipe unlocks and it trades down to five and guys are losing cash. Um, but you know, you have that wave of selling, which are guys that really don't want to own this. They, they bought it because they thought they were going to, uh, you know, rip off the public. Uh, and then you have the insiders, and usually that's in various tranches, and it's never very straightforward. It's always very if-then, you know, 180 days after the deal closes, if the shares are above this level price, yeah. and, you know, after the second earnings release, if the shares are above this price, then X number of shares, and you know, the founders can't sell for another period of time. So if you just read the document, and um, the document's somewhat cryptic, but if you read the document and keep track of when all these people are allowed to sell, there's moments in time where these things waterfall 20, 30%, and it's literally free money. Like, you just got to read the damn document. And then <laughs> you, mean, uh, you mean in the sense that the float really increases, like, uh by an incredible amount, or what do you mean by a waterfall? Well, so the thing is, so you have this public security that's trading millions of dollars a day that has a supposed market cap in the billions. Right. And everyone involved in the thing, everyone in the ecosystem knows it's worthless. 
outside of the cash and the balance sheet that's probably going to get stolen, there, there, there is no value. Okay. Right. And so everyone wants out. And a lot of the people, you know, the pipe guys, they paid 10. But everyone else in that uh, dynamic often, you know, has free shares effectively because, I mean, the company has a few dollars, you know, invested in it. Employees got their shares for free. Founders got their shares for free. Early VC maybe sent 50 cents a share. So if everyone sells at $2, they're still coming out ahead. So it's just a question of how do I blast out and turn something that's totally worthless into something you know that is worth something like dollars. And so these guys are trying to get out as fast as they can. And they're often just blasting out. Just remember also, whereas retail guys have no idea what they own, um, you guys that actually own these shares and own millions and millions of shares, they've read these documents. And they know that 15 days from now, you know, their buddy gets to sell and another 15 days you know, the venture capital guy, they get to sell. They know how much money is coming. I mean, how many shares are coming in behind them. They just got to get it all done to beat the other guy out. And so, look, it's, it's, it's literally free money sitting on the screen. You got to read the damn document. Uh, we put together some of this data. Uh, it's through these SPACs and it's too much stuff. We, we, right. we started the process with IPOs and we're now working on SPACs. Uh, we, we hired a really smart guy to do it with us, and we're hoping to hire, like I said, a few more guys. Uh, you know, now that we put a paywall down and have some revenue here, we could hire more people and make the product better. Uh, we intend to uh, dramatically increase the quality of what we're producing and add value for people. Uh, you know, for anyone who's watching this, I uh, recommend uh, taking it for a free trial. We're offering four week free trials. Go to kedm.com. I'm sorry, I'm marketing in the show, but. I believe in the product. <laughs> oh, me too. I think it's great. And people should definitely check it out. Maybe uh, one more screen. Uh, I'll flag. Maybe we can t um, talk quickly about some uh, companies you, you like, if you like. Any. Yeah, sure. Um, you also do like the short squeezing, which is super popular uh, since the GameStop uh, thing. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, short squeeze is another proprietary screen. I mean, in the end, uh, you know, there's lots of places that will show you the 50 most short securities and people short stocks often because they're crap. Um, but lately, guys that are short these things are getting run over. Um, yeah, historically, it's like a, a terrible strategy to go along uh, highly shorted names. Yeah, I mean, but they, they tend to be more volatile because of the short interest and the potential for a buy-in. Um, you know, we, we put that screen out there because it's been moving markets. And I think it's very important for people to look at that every two weeks. The data gets re-updated and say, you know, hey, what's happening? And, you know, what are the, the names that potentially could have an explosive move? But, you know, we've traded some of these. We've made a lot of money out of some of these. But I wouldn't say, you know, you, you buy Kedem for that. I'd say you buy it from your CEO change and all the other stuff we're putting together that's truly proprietary stuff. And, um, and do you think it like changed like the long short, um, how it's well, being run? Yeah, I, I well, I mean, for the life of me, I don't know why people are short. I, I can understand, uh, you know, this 20 million shares in the float and 50 million are unlocking next week. I want to be short and you can be short by, you know, directional short. You can be short by selling calls. You could, you know, short common and write puts against it. There's a lot of ways to harvest that, uh, you know, window of time where you know a lot of stock is getting sold and you're taking a very truncated uh, amount of risk time-wise where, you know, if, you know, you, you kind of know when the, the event's going to happen. I, I, I but, I mean, I have this view called Project Zimbabwe where I think the stock market's going to go up a lot. Uh, I think you'd be ludicrous to show up to work saying, you know, then over the next year, I think the stock market is going to go up a lot. Two years out, it's going to go up a lot. Five years out, it's going to go up a lot. Why would you be short? Why would you be betting that it's not going up when the government has, as clearly as possible, told you that they intend to make it go up? Um, and... I just don't understand why people would go and short the market. And I really don't understand why people go and look at a security where, you know, half the shares are short and decide that that's the thing they want to uh, short. I mean, what we've learned through uh, uh, the last year is that 
social media, you know, including Reddit and Twitter and these guys all team up. I don't know how they do it, but they all team up on these names and they, they, they make uh, the short sellers hurt badly. And they tend to go, I mean, it's one of the only, normally Wall Street exists to take money from the retail and give it to the professionals. It's one of the rare times in my career where uh, the money is repeatedly coming out of the pockets of the professionals, often some of the smartest professionals, and it's going to the retail guy. It's, it defies logic, but, um, you know, it's, it's a fascinating dynamic to watch. And uh, I think, you know, if you're going to be shorting, you should be really aware of the short interest in your names. And when that short interest starts getting above 20%, you should get really scared. Right. Well, yeah, I think uh, some professionals are benefiting as well, but there's definitely some getting hurt. Oh, yeah. Uh, actually, GameStop was a sort of a wake-up call for me because I think I got hurt on the same phenomenon, shorting things like Tesla, and Neo, and just, you know, you, you, you limit your losses, but you don't know why you're losing. But uh, I think it was kind of a similar dynamic, a little bit slower, but... Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I don't short. I, I I'll buy some puts occasionally, but I, I just don't short. Um, outside of you know really truncated things like an IPO unlock or a SPAC unlock or something. Um, yeah, it's, it's just a way to lose money. <laughs> it's yeah. It's definitely uh, been a headache for the last many years. Yeah, it's, it's a long time ago that went that worked great. Um, let's see. Yeah, you, you've got our great stuff like rights offerings and privatizations, but, but now that I have you, I know you're a big bull on oil. Uh, I think that's super interesting. Are you buying any companies or I know you're buying futures um, a, a few years out. So you're thinking like um, you know, short term, like one year, two year, may go anywhere maybe, but like longer term is going up. Uh, are you buying companies as well? Because those are usually leveraged to longer term oil or just um, futures? Well, I own uh, the 25 futures piece. I own uh, the futures call options. I also own uh, the, the 23 90 by 100 call spread to these. Um, you know, that's actually a bet on uh, the futures price of oil. Um, I think. So the call spread is you buy a 90 call and you sell a 100 call, right? Correct. Uh, I came into that for about 63 cents. So it pays off 15 times, uh, which is a pretty good return in my book. Uh, you know, I, I don't, I'm not the sort of guy that buys a stock at 20 because I think it's going to 24. I, I mean, we're looking for multi bagger upside and everything we do. Uh, we're not locking up our capital. Um, but, you know, in terms of uh, oil stocks, I'm not a geologist. I have no special insight. We own one producer right now. We actually bought it as a net net. It was more that uh, some of the parts and company Sandridge, uh, you know, I was buying it uh, at 75 cents a dollar when they had uh, $2 a share of cash <laughs> and they were profitable and they had no debt. Uh, you know, today the stock's at almost $6. So, you know, it's been, you know, it's called a six or eight bagger already. Um, I think I've heard you talk about it. It traded for less than the value of its headquarter at some point, right? Correct. It, it traded for less than the cash in the headquarters of the balance sheet. Um, oh, right. And, you know, so it was, a, it was a net net that was profitable, but oil prices were terrible and it was barely profitable. New CEO came in, cut costs. I really liked him. The market didn't realize that there was a lot of fat there to cut. I, I, I mean, I, we were pretty profitable. And so they, they've taken their LOE way down, their break evens way down. Uh, they, they, they consolidated some royalty interests and, you know, like basic block and tackle. They sold hey, so a, a new CEO came in here as well. So that hit one of your uh, like things you like to look well, for. Often we'll have a few of these screens overlap. So, you know, right. Sandwich, it, it's, it's a, uh, on our uh, Fallen Angels screen. Fallen Angels is stocks that are down a lot over the last couple of years. Uh, where they trade for you know, way less than fair value. Uh, you just don't know when you can get paid, but you kind of know you're going to get paid. And if you look at the Fallen Angels, I think I mean, we've probably had 30 names that have left that screen in the year we've had Ketam now, and almost all of them were multi-baggers. I think we've had one that we took off break-even-ish or small loss. 
Um, you know, it's just a great uh, place to play. I mean, that, that's kind of a, a proprietary screen too. Uh, but the sandwich has been there since it was about a dollar. Like I said, it's six dollars now. They've got uh, over two dollars a share of cash. At current energy prices, they're making north of two dollars a, a year in cash flow. Uh, so you know, stock trades at six and they'll have more than four dollars of cash at year end. It's mispriced. I mean, it's internal decline, but the internal decline can give you more than today's price. I wouldn't say you should buy it here. I mean, you probably should never buy something that's up six times in a year. Uh, you know, I've actually sold some, but um, I think it's going higher. Right. Um, but and then what I wanted to ask you uh, one question about the your like your CEO thing, right? Because I kind of le learned that um, the first when a new CEO comes in, like the first quarter, you like come out with all the bad news and like uh, pin it all on his predecessor. Do you find yeah. that that's true, or and do you avoid yeah, usually. Like the quarter or and get it later, or do you just take that? Um, just no, you're going to, I mean, this is a usual fact pattern where, I mean, look, if a company's doing well and a CEO retires, usually the new CEO is handpicked. He's not going to, you know, say something bad about his former boss. But if it's a situation that's been a mess, like Sandridge was, um, I wouldn't say they had, they didn't say anything bad about the old guy, but they uh, took a giant, uh, big bath. Um, yeah, they but, took like you know, ride downs and stuff. Yeah, but when you look at what the new CEO did, he did exactly what you would do with energy prices low. He fired, instead, we're not drilling anymore. He fired everyone in the drilling operation. Uh, they cut a lot of costs. He did exactly what you'd expect the CEO change scan to say. He took the company that was going in one direction, where they were drilling uneconomic wells, and they were just doing it because that's what they were doing. And he took it in a different direction, where they uh, stopped drilling, and they stockpiled cash, and they cut costs. Um, you know, he just left the company, the new CEO in place. We'll see on the conference call in about two weeks what the new plan is. Uh, you know, the new plan might be good. It might be bad. It might be, you know, steady eddy. Uh, we'll, we'll see. But you were asking, do I own a lot of energy companies? No, I do not because uh, they tend to be destructive of capital uh, through the full cycle. I mean, obviously, you know, at the bottom of the cycle, you want to own them and probably be selling them around here. Um, you know, I, I believe the reason oil prices will be higher in a few years is government interference and regulation. You know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a carbon tax on energy extraction, if there's higher royalties, if, you know, much, much like they, they banned uh, drilling on federal land, pipeline changes. There's going to be a bunch of things that make it very frustrating and annoying to be an oil company. So if you make it oh, yeah. to be an oil company, uh, the price of oil is probably going to go up because they're going to drill less. So uh, you, you really don't want to be an oil company if, you, if the government says they're going to kind of screw you. You, you just want to own oil. <laughs> I mean, and it's, I mean yeah. Biden has said he wants to have an energy crisis. So, you know, if the president <laughs> has declared an energy crisis, he's probably going to create an energy crisis. Uh, you don't have to be very smart. You just basically listen to these guys. Um, and so we own that. We own quite a lot of energy services. Um, you know, not so much that um, super bullish on energy services, but a year ago, oil went negative and everyone stopped drilling. They stopped doing anything except for basic maintenance. And it's a year of deferred maintenance now. And guys are going to start spending a little more. And so Wall Street works on the first and second derivative uh, rate of change. And the rate of change is positive because coming from no exploration to some exploration is bullish. <laughs> It's accelerating, you know, the second derivative. And, and when, when exploration stopped, a lot of these companies went bankrupt and uh, the equipment was still there and it came out of bankruptcy with minimal debt. Some of them came out with net cash and you're buying a bunch of equipment at 10 cents on replacement cost. And, you know, at, in prior cycles, at the top of the cycle, the equipment's worth two or three times replacement costs. And I came into it at, you know, 0.1. And so to get to three times replacement cost, you make 30 times your money. Plus, you know, hopefully they create some value along the way. I, I have a feeling this cycle won't have the same amplitude as prior cycles, but getting to half of replacement costs of five bagger, that's, that's pretty good still. And, you know, these companies are profitable today at very low levels of spending across the industry. 
because a lot of competitors went out of business and they have a bit of pricing power for the first time in a while and they don't have huge debt service. Plus through bankruptcy, they're able to fire a lot of people who need. So I don't know, it's, it's not a bad place to be. But once again, a lot of these things are up a bunch. So they, what, you, what I try to do is buy right at the inflection when it's cheapest and take a little bit of a leap of faith, but you get in so cheaply that you don't get hurt when you get it wrong. And I mean, I get stuff wrong. I get a lot of stuff wrong. And so, um, you know, it, these things are up some. I'm, I'm not sure if you want to be chasing and buying, but if you're long, you just kind of ride it. Right. And so see where this cycle goes and you kind of fine tune the portfolio as more data comes. So I think kind of your strategy, you take like a lot of like smaller kind of losses. Um, uh, because you're buying already at a very low level and then sometimes it just doesn't work and then you you're like okay it is it's not going to inflect and you cut it and then you have your winners and those are big is that kind of your that's how it's supposed to work <laughs> it doesn't always work that way but right. um no I, look if you buy a bunch of equipment at 0.1 times replacement cost well no one's buying new equipment because they could buy used equipment cheaper. So there's no new supply coming in the industry. And 0.1 replacement cost is really cheap. Um, could I go to 0.05? Yeah, why not? Um, you, know, you don't really know, but if you have a tailwind and you know that demand for the inventory for the equipment starting to pick up, then it's probably not going to go too badly against me. Could there be a relapse? You know, if every, you know, countries locked down, and oil goes back to 40. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, that's kind of the risk you take with anything, though. But if you're coming in as cheaply as I'm coming in, if the thesis gets pushed back a year or two, the thesis is still alive. And if something dynamically changes the thesis so that I know I'm wrong, I'll get out. But I got in so cheap, I probably don't lose much. If you look at right. a lot of the stuff I invest in, and you know, there's always exceptions where I get really badly hurt. Mostly I lose 10%, 15%, 20% at most. And you know, some of them, it doesn't work out. You make 20% because you bought so cheaply. Um, and the winners, you're going to make multi-bagger. And if you put a few of these uh, plays on your book at a time, and I don't have that many. I usually have six to 12 themes. And usually the top five are most of the book, but if you have two of them work each year and you have two kind of go nowhere and you get one wrong, you're going to have a hundred percent year. Like that, that, that's kind of how the game is supposed to work. Right. And, uh, you know, the, the goal is to get triple digit returns without, uh, taking any risk or taking you know, minimal risk. Right. Yeah. Um, I think this uh, whole energy transition, it's going to be chaos. It, there's going, you know, so many, so much change, uh, there should be opportunity um it's what's happening going to happen to supply it's uh anyone's guess but i don't know did you follow like the what happened to royal dish shell uh they, they got like, yeah like a I mean, court order for to uh well, yeah, basically it's, called, it's a rogue judge it's in your country uh <laughs> and a rogue judge decided that royal dutch cell the hundred year old company with you know what tens of thousands of employees they're no longer allowed to export for oil. Like, right. you know, it's, it's like a judge. They, they, they no even longer. have to sell like half of their assets. Well, that's basically what it comes down to. Right. I mean, and a judge anywhere can rule anything. And I assume they're going to appeal. And I assume it'll get overturned. But it sends a very scary message to any energy company that is making investment decisions. Because... You know, energy, is, it's not like you turn on the faucet at your house. This is, you know, even shale, you're making multi-year decisions. In the case of the, the big projects that uh, the integrated oils like the shell were, were making, these are 10-year decisions from start to really production with lots of engineering. And if you are worried yeah, if that... Shale, if shale starts to decline, I mean, because that's, you know, can turn pretty fast and we've got a, kind of gotten used to that, but it doesn't, didn't used to be like that at all. I think you're going to have a lot of uh, things that constrict future supply growth. Remember, oil uh, decays. I mean, you have a decline curve. Right. So, you know, globally, a few million barrels five to 10 million a year decay. Um, 
and then you're going to have uh, less uh, capex, and you should have an energy crisis. Um, right. And you know, in, in the past, uh, the oil companies would just ramp up production. But if you're not allowed to make uh, long-term capital investment decisions, and you know you don't have, you know, that's for the big guys. And you know, the big guys in America, you know, they they have pirate activists take over their board and tell them not to produce any more oil. Well, then who's going to produce oil? I mean, the Saudis will produce oil, and that's it. And, and we think they they are in decline as well, but uh, just naturally. Maybe no one really knows, but. <laughs> I mean, in the end, you, you're going to have less, uh, you're going to have more concentrated production from fewer guys that are going to dictate the price. Hmm. And I don't think you're going to have the supply response we've seen in the past where oil goes up and people go to their bank and they say, look, oil is 80 now. We know, you know, we've done the engineering work. We know what the data is. Give me a billion dollars to produce it. We're going to hedge one third of the production for the next five years. So you're guaranteed to get your money back. And it's a risk-free calculation that the bankers can lend on. Now, you know, the board of directors is scared that parts are going to take over the company. So they don't even want to make a five-year plan. They don't even want to produce oil. The bank is scared that someone's going to go protest outside of their headquarters. They don't want to lend on oil. Like, how are you going to get new oil? Um, I mean, it'll get solved, but it's going to get solved with, by people that have much higher return uh, hurdles, you know, guys like me that are going to have to look at this stuff and say, you know, I don't want to make live or plus 500. You know, I want to double my money every year. And when I see returns like that, then I'll be capital capitalists. Um, and so I, I think you're going to see a higher energy price. And that's why I'm the, the futures and the futures calls. So I, I think it's a much cleaner way to play this than, uh, you know, you show up one day and your energy company got hijacked and they're putting up windmills. Like, I don't want that. Right, and so, but it's, so this is pretty unusual for you, actually, right? To uh, do like a straight future commodity um, play, or it's, or it's quite unusual. I I think the last time I did something like this was in like 2004, when I bought silver futures at like four dollars, <laughs> and you know they were like a ten bagger in a few years, um, and. You know, one thing with futures, and you have to keep this in mind, you know, your broker will give you enough margins that you can uh, bankrupt yourself. Um, you know, I, I don't leverage this up. I'm not going out there and, you know, margining out. Uh, you know, if I decide I want to have, you know, X number of dollars of exposure to oil, I don't leverage it three times. I put it on dollar for dollar. I treat it like an equity. Because as we've learned, oil can go negative and, you know, you'll get taken out of the game if you're leveraged 10 to 1. So just keep that in mind for playing at home. I mean, I'm not, you know, going crazy here. Right. But no, I think the last time I did this, and there might be one other time, oh, I bought some gold futures, uh, you know, I bought gold futures a few times. But okay. the first time I bought, like, long dated out of the money stuff, I think it was 2004, the last time I did it, and silver was very good. I mean, once again, you had a situation where, it was unprofitable to produce silver and there was no new supply coming. And there were a number of reasons why demand would go up and we got it right. And when you look at it, you know, I owned uh, silver, but I also owned like Pan American silver and I owned, that one was a success, but it wasn't a 10 bagger. And so the other silver like companies I own, they got the geology wrong or they got the permits wrong or they got the mine plan wrong. For every Pan American, there was like a five bagger. <laughs> a lot of these, went nowhere. A few of them went down in a silver bull market. It's, you don't want to own the producer. If you believe in the commodity, you go buy out of money calls. I mean, these oil calls are like 12 implied vol for 2025. And we know oil is a 30 to 50 realized vol product. And I'm buying five years out for 12 vol. It just seems wrong to me. Right. Uh, so it's super interesting uh, idea. Um, maybe yeah, we do. Uh, I wanna, um, you know, let you go and enjoy your day. Uh, but maybe if you do, you have like a, a last idea or something that you think is really great. Um, love to talk about. Or I'm putting you on the spot a little bit. <laughs> I mean, we talked about a bunch of stuff I like. Um, okay. You know, honestly, I haven't been buying much lately. Um, mm -hmm. 
you know, I'm one of those guys that buys it when everyone's selling and I, I tend to sell it back to them when uh, it's gone straight up. And I mean, we're 15 straight months of the market going up pretty much nonstop. I mean, everything's up a lot. So there's, there's less that I'm doing. I'm doing more on the event driven stuff because stuff comes out of an event driven situation and it's often fundamentally mispriced. The, the question is, you know, in which direction it's mispriced, but you know, when something changes at a business, it's going to be mispriced. If you can uh, realize what's happening, you know, a spinoff is going to be mispriced on day one. You know, process like an underwriting that, that has an order book setting the opening price, it just kind of starts trading one day. A bankruptcy is very similar, except for the bankruptcy was usually not even like a roadshow. It just starts trading one day. And this leads to dramatic mispricing all over the place. Um, you know, I, I would say that's where the best opportunity is going to be. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a little different than my thematic stuff. But um, yeah, but if it is what it is. You know, I think it's great. Um, I'm so, you know, I've been too fearful for the last few years, but uh, I'm not, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with uh, how the market's been so good for so long and uh, where the, uh, you know, where, how far the Fed can take it, and when Marcus may be going to say no, you, you can do more. Um, so no, I think event driven is great because you 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 still get a return, but uh, uh, you're protected from a little bit of uh, right. But I, I think that you watch the news every day, and about once every three to six months, something happens in the news that makes you say, "Aha! You know, this thing might be interesting now." And uh, you, know, you kind of pile in, um, you know, event driven, like I said, stuff's always happening. Uh, there's always corporate events, uh, but there's a lot of stuff that I own right now. And, you know, it's doubled or tripled from where I bought it. And I think it's going to double and triple in the next few years. And uh, the great thing about Project Zimbabwe, which is what I call uh, uh, unlimited fiscal and monetary stimulus is that some of these businesses like St. Joe, we're, we're in the first inning still, but I think it's going to happen. And yeah. I mean, the stock's more than doubled from my cost basis, but I was buying more at today's price. Uh, and and um, you know, I'm taking my winnings from event driven. I'm just putting more of it into St. Joe because, right. you know, here we are and we're in an everything bubble and here's land which should be very well protected from inflation. It's trading a, you know, a third of you know, <laughs> the yeah. liquidation value. It's, it, it's yeah. just wrong. You know, and I love your uh, Zimbabwe framework because it's, you know, it's very, uh, it illustrates sort of some of the things that are going on and uh, why you don't want to step in front of the freight train, which I probably did too much. But um, it, it also like brings this question, like at some point, the um, people are not going to like, like the dollar anymore, right? I, I mean, it's probably not close to that point, but. Do, do you fear like, because that should stop the Fed and uh, this kind of policy, right? Or What are they going to buy? I mean, if they don't what, buy dollars. Yeah, what other currency would you want to own? Um, yeah, I think more Euro, more uh, Yuan. But, uh, so like I mean, that, maybe. look at the Euro. It has a negative yield. It really costs you money to own the thing. Mm. Uh, was it 20 countries that all hate each other? Like, yeah, it's, it's not meant for stability. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe other stock, stock markets, maybe. Um, yeah, I mean, state look, in Japan. I see the dollar as a thing you have in your account until you find something better to do with your money. And you're going to have dollars for a few months and you'll find something good to do with your money. And yeah. if you're going to have dollars, you're going to have rubles or you're going to have euros. Like, I don't know, it's, it's this zero frictional cost to exchange one for the other. And it's just kind of, you know, something to hold while you wait for the thing you want to own. Um, so I'm, I don't really think about the dollar going down or I mean, what's it going to go up down against? All yeah, it's just that down. I think it's the only thing that can kind of force the F Fed to change its uh, No, that ideas. won't force the Fed. The thing that will force the Fed is when middle-class guys can't fill up their car anymore, 
because oil is too expensive. When it's painfully expensive to fill up your car, they're going to print and stimulate until something breaks. And it's not going to be food. Probably in America, we'll probably create food riots in third world countries. But America, I mean, the average guy can afford food. It's going to be when uh, all disposable income goes uh, to the Middle East because they've created an energy crisis. And that's what we'll, they'll, they'll probably respond like governments always do by giving you like an energy stimmy and, you know, here's 10 free gallons and you just, you know, they print the money and they hand them to you. Uh, but you'll eventually have, because of physical settled products as opposed to uh, cash settled, that's the thing that'll break. And so, you know, if you know that they're going to stimulate until they, they basically break that thing, then you want to be along with the thing that, that's going to break them. Um, you know, they're going to intervene in the gold market, the silver market, they'll intervene in, you know, currency and rates and S&Ps and junk bonds. All these are cash markets. They can just intervene. And then in the physicals market, they can't intervene and put oil in my car. And I think they're going to stimulate to the point where global demand, instead of growing one or two, is growing three or maybe even four. And they're going to make it impossible to produce. And it's supply demand. They'll solve it eventually. And you'll have energy as an imputed cost to almost everything in life. It'll eventually create lots of inflation. And I think the dollar will roughly be range bound. It's what, 80 by 100. Uh, the DXY will be just roughly range bound. And because everyone's going to have the same problems because everyone's following the same policy. That's true. It's not, definitely not unique to the United States. That's true. Uh, Kepi, I, I want to let you go and uh, enjoy your day. Um, but uh, before you do, could you please tell people uh, where they can find you, follow you? I, th I think you're on Twitter. Uh, and please also tell them where they can find KDM and uh, try it out. I think you just told about KEDM.com. Uh, you know, we have a four week free trial. Uh, I think once you've tried it out, uh, you'll realize that you really can't invest without it. Uh, we don't make stock recommendations. We don't give you a trade of the month or anything like that. All we do is give you the data and let you go hunting for the opportunities. Uh, everyone interprets data differently. And, you know, uh, uh, my sincere hope is that two people will look at the same you know, data point and have different time frames one guy will go short one guy will go long and they'll both be super happy that we flagged that event for them um i have a blog adventures in capitalism uh, i haven't written there in a couple of weeks i need to get going on that but uh kedm launched uh, i've been then. reading it for years i think it's a great blog it's very oh, funny thanks. yeah no, thanks i appreciate it and it's, it's free it's always going to stay free uh, and, uh, and you put that. great ideas on there as well. Uh, I think historically you put out some ideas there, uh, the, the, the things that you find on your screens and right. Yeah, I mean, we, we appreciate that. We've had a lot of multi-baggers that have flagged through there, but also, you know, uh, contrarian of view on current events. Um, and then, you know, on Twitter at, at each copy, but mostly I just shit post. Uh, I don't post too much. That's uh, all I'm interested in that. It's more, look, finance is a really dumb industry with a lot of very, very smart people doing dumb things. And I think it's really fun just to call out stupidity and hubris and retardation. I mean, in the end, you have a Maybe to of, remind yourself uh, not to yeah. fall. I mean, not to take yourself too seriously. You have a bunch of people all suited up, wearing ties, pretending they're all smart. And really, they're just, fools in the room but they have all the money because they're managing money for their clients and they're the ones moving the market and oftentimes you listen to the stuff they say and realize they have no idea what they're talking about and that's when you need to make money <laughs> and so i just like making fun of stupidity out there uh, you know, none of this is investment advice that's uh, uh i think it's really enjoyable and i really like the uh, thing i've learned so much Please uh, enjoy your day. Hey, thanks a lot. You know, appreciate you having me on. No, it's uh, entirely my pleasure. Bye.